Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Melissa. Uh, hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. Um, so I get to serve here full time at Oasis as the Oasis Kids and Events Coordinator. Um, and I also am one of your student leaders here on Thursdays, and I'm super excited to spend time with you guys tonight. Um, we are in our third week of our Ghosted series. Uh, so we all know like what Ghosted means, kind of like when someone disappears on you. And we've been talking about what that looks like through different types of relationships. So Nikki kicked us off the first week with talking about how it feels when you've been let down by your family. And then Walter talked to us last week about feeling like you've been abandoned by God. And tonight, in honor of Valentine's Day being yesterday, we are talking about what a lot of us think of when we hear the word relationships, with, which is romantic relationships. Ooh. <laughs> so, um, you know, relationships can be either one of the greatest parts of your life or it can be one of the worst. And sometimes we kind of get little warning signs of which way it's going to go in the form of red flags. What are some of your biggest red flags? Just shout it out. What are some red flags? Like deal breakers. <laughs> like deal breakers in a relationship to you. Looking at other people. Yeah, that's, that's bad. Stuff like that, exactly. So I, in the past, have a history of kind of ignoring red flags. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I'm not alone. You guys make me feel better. So I feel like God gives us the stories that he does so we can learn from them, but then also so we can help other people learn from them and to see God and how he works in our stories. So the best way for me to talk about relationships is to share my own story with you guys. And I'm going to be perfectly honest, like when we were figuring out who was gonna take what topic within this series, like this is the one I did not wanna do um, because it's super uncomfortable. And I was like, give me anything else. But I prayed through it and wrestled through it and it became really, really clear this is what God wanted me to do. So I'm gonna get really vulnerable with you guys tonight, so just bear with me. But first, let's just give it to God. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for every single person here, for the fact that we get to be here with each other and with you. Um, and God, I thank you for all the relationships that you've placed in our lives, whether they're good or bad, they're all there for a reason. And I pray that through this series and through tonight that we would just learn how to approach those better. Um, God, I just pray that you would be with me, strengthen me, speak through me, and that every single word, every single piece of this would just be about you and nothing else. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So you guys know me as half of the cheesiest couple ever, as married to my favorite person in the entire world. Um, and before I get into the like messy part of my history, I just want to like give you a shout out first. Um, <laughs> just, I am amazed every single day at Lewis, at our marriage, at how God has brought us together. It's just honestly amazing. And just, just thank you for being you. I love you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but this story is not about my relationship with Lewis. This story is about the very hard lesson that I learned before him. So what a lot of you may not know about me is that I was married before. Um, I met this guy uh, freshman year of college. Let's call him Voldemort. <laughs> um, there's a picture. So ask any of my close friends, this is actually what I call him. <laughs> This is, no, no, not actually him, no. He doesn't need to be shown. Um, so I started off calling him he who must not be named, but that was just too long, so Voldemort. So I met Voldemort freshman year of college through a mutual friend, and things were decent at the beginning. Obviously, people put their best foot forward first. 
Um, but there were definitely some red flags. Things like I would catch him in lies constantly. He would just say hurtful things on purpose. I don't know if he thought it was funny or what, but whatever. Um, he would push me into doing things I knew weren't right. Just a lot of stuff. And I overlooked all of these things because I was so wrapped up in the idea of being in a relationship. I even almost broke up with him once, um, and I didn't because I was like, we've been together for so long, and I didn't want that time to be wasted, which, for the record, is a horrible reason. Like, yeah, maybe that time was wasted in your eyes, but you have so many more years ahead of you. So, we got married a couple years after we graduated college, and not super long into that, things just started shifting. Like, he was just borderline emotionally abusive. We never spent any time together. We even ate separately most of the time. Um, he was just constantly criticizing every single move I made, comparing me to other people, putting me down, going back on promises that we made when we decided to get married. And it was just really, really not great. And I feel like we all grow up with these like fairy tales in our head of what marriage is gonna be. Like you're gonna be best friends and happy and in love and you know, there will be bad times here and there, but overall it's pretty good. And so I came to this realization that like that stuff was just all for movies. It didn't exist, it wasn't real. And this is, this is, what, I, this is what I got. See, he was physically present, sort of, but he wasn't actually like there in the marriage. And what I didn't realize was that I was being emotionally ghosted. So my points tonight are based on the red flags that I ignored and the antidote that we have to those in the Bible and in Christ so that we can have healthy and happy and God-honoring relationships. And my first point tonight is choose someone who treats you like you deserve to be treated. All those red flags I mentioned were not okay. Way too often, we put up with a lot of nonsense from people for I don't even know why to avoid an argument or maybe we just wanna be with this person at all costs or maybe we think it'll get better or maybe we even think that's what we deserve. We make excuses for people for the craziest things. I'll let you guys laugh at me for a second. Here's one of mine. There was one time he went to a concert with his ex, just the two of them, and he told me that he had to because it was her birthday present to him. Uh, what? You guys, like, and I just let it slide? Like, what? Okay, don't do that. And if I'm being perfectly honest, again, I've heard a lot of similar things even in this room. I have heard you got people making excuses for the dumbest things. Like, oh yeah, I know this guy's cheating on me, but eh. Like, can we just agree to stop doing that? Like, you guys deserve so much better. And before you start falling into this trap of thinking that you don't deserve better, let's look at what the Bible says. Genesis 127 says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. So God made us in his image, not like a physical image, to reflect his spirit and his character. He created us to be set apart, to be part of his family. And it says the word created for a reason. He lovingly, painstakingly created every single one of you intentionally. So before anyone else in our lives, God gave us the first and the realest love there is because God is love. And because of that, before we can really understand what love is, we first have to understand God's love. And only once we've done that can we really truly love and value ourselves. And only once we've done that can we even think about giving and receiving the love that we really do deserve. Every single person here, you guys are the son or the daughter of the king of kings. You are a masterpiece, you are a treasure. And does that sound like somebody who deserves to be treated horribly? No. no. So remember that and don't ever let anybody treat you like you are any less. The Bible also tells us in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. 
God gives us a lot of responsibilities and things to take care of here on earth, and one of those is ourselves. We are the most precious thing to him. So because of that, he tells us flat out, protect yourselves. That means setting boundaries, saying no to things that you know aren't good for you, sticking up for yourself. And I know I'm one to talk. That's something I'm constantly working on. But don't let things into your heart that are bad for you. And that includes people. You may think you can overlook these things in the beginning, but you don't realize deep down how it really is affecting you. And I know right now, being in middle school, high school, being in a relationship feels like the most important thing in the world. But it really should not come at the expense of your self-esteem or your mental health. Do not settle. And I know we all have these mental checklists of things that we want in our potential person. So what are some of those things on like your checklist? Like what are you looking for? Just yell them out. What? Bingo, Phoebe. That is what I was looking for. My second point should always be number one on that list. Choose someone who brings you closer to God. Your person should bring you closer to God, not farther away from him. So Voldemort, or as Ron called him, doodle brain, um, <laughs> Voldemort held me back from growing in my relationship with God. He said he was a Christian, but it was really like surface level. He didn't really live it out. Um, like the only reason that we went to church was because I would drag him to church. And he always wanted to get there after worship because he said he hated it. And the whole time he would be sitting there like, can we, can we go, can we go? And I wanted to join a small group together. He didn't want to. He never wanted to talk about God at home. All of that stuff. And one of the last things he ever said to me in like the most sarcastic, condescending way ever was, you need to be with someone who's in church. And he meant it like so sarcastic and so mean, but he was absolutely right. In 1 Corinthians six fourteen, it talks about this idea of being equally yoked. It says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Now this verse isn't telling us, is telling us not to be yoked or attached to non-believers. And that doesn't mean that we can't be friends with them. We should be friends with non-believers, if anything, so we can witness to them. What it's saying is not to completely intertwine your life with them, to not put them in such a position of high influence in your life. There's this clip I saw from another church that put it like this. If God's really the most important thing in your life, if God is the king of your life, why would you wanna spend your life with someone who doesn't see him as their king? Don't put yourself in a position to compromise your integrity, your loyalty, your standards, your commitment to God. It's not worth it. And obviously there's things that we want in a person, right? We want someone who likes the same things as us or is into the same music or is cute or whatever. And all those things, yeah, they're great. But there has to be so much more than that. It has to be so much deeper. Your values and your priorities have to align or it is not gonna work. It's just gonna cause tension down the road or even cause you to compromise the most core parts of who you are. Not only is this what, it's, what we're called to do, it's gonna make such a big difference in the way that person treats you. Picture someone who makes you better, who prays for you, who prays with you, who goes to God for guidance about your relationship. Someone who doesn't need to be convinced of your worth. That is the person and the relationship that is worth waiting for. And please don't fall into the same trap of thinking you can change someone like I did. So how can you tell that someone's truly a Christ follower? Like my ex, someone can put on a really good show in the beginning. It does take discernment, but you can really tell by the fruit, by the product of them, how they live their life. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does this person embody those things? Are they just a believer in God or are they a follower of God? Because those are two very different things. Even Satan believed in God. Does this person just say they're a Christian or are they truly living it out? Do they spend time with God? Do they read the Bible, pray, go to church? Do they incorporate their faith into their life every single day? 
Are they pushing you closer to God or are they pulling you further away from him? Do they make you feel self-conscious about your faith or are they seeking to grow in your faith together? Are they pushing you into sin or are they holding you accountable for things? See, I ignored all those red flags. I was naive and I thought it was gonna get better. There's a couple phrases that I wanna share with you guys. Man's rejection is God's protection. Man's rejection is God's protection. Or rejection is merely a redirection. I'm gonna let that sit for a second. And that's not just like, yeah, it sounds cheesy, but those aren't just things that people say to make themselves feel better. They really are true. Chances are you really didn't need to be with that person anyway. And being ghosted by someone is really just a blessing in disguise that's saving you from worse pain down the road or it's just putting you on the path that you were really meant to be on. See, after the divorce, I made it a non-negotiable in my next relationship that we would have to be equally yoked. And now, I'm married to someone who constantly pushes me in my faith. Someone who makes me better, who really does help me grow and learn. And not only do we get to follow God together, we get to do ministry together. I went from someone who never wanted to hear me talk about God to someone who is always sitting right there supporting me while I talk to everybody about God on a stage. I went from someone who I had to drag to church every Sunday to someone who teaches in church. And that is just mind-blowing. Right from the beginning of our relationship, we would sit in church together, watch sermons, we would read books about relationships, reach out to couples that we looked up to, because we wanted to make sure that we were doing this thing right. We are intentional about keeping God at the center of our relationship, and that is the biggest green flag there could ever be. My relationship with God is the strongest and the closest it's ever been, and who I've chosen to share my life with is a huge factor in that. So going back to the story, one day, on a Friday night, totally out of nowhere, after five years of marriage, Voldemort says, hey, I gotta talk to you about something. Yeah, uh uh-oh. I'm not in love with you, and I figured I'd tell you on a Friday, so that way we have the weekend to talk about it and end things. What? Yeah. Don't scare me. 10 years together, five years of marriage, and he wanted to end it over a weekend like it was absolutely nothing. No major blow up, nothing like this had never come up before, but maybe I should have seen it coming from all those red flags. And I know divorce isn't biblical. It's not something I believe in. I've always seen it as kind of a bad word and I still don't believe in it. So I did everything I could to avoid it from happening. For months, I dragged him to therapy, to a marriage retreat. I was constantly trying to have conversations about how can we fix this? And I was just praying and praying and praying desperately, like, God, I know you hate this. I hate this, so like, what's up? Why is this happening? Can this just not happen? And I even acted totally normal. I didn't tell a single one of my family or friends what was going on, because in my mind, it was gonna be fixed, and I didn't want them to hate him after. But he was already checked out. And months later, the papers were signed, and I found myself in a situation and with a label that I never expected, divorce. Side note, the very first people outside of my family to know what was going on with me were Pastor Garfield and Marsha and Pastor Guy and Tanya. And having them praying for me and counseling me and being there with me through it made a huge difference. So when you're at the lowest points of your life, fight the urge to isolate yourself. Like seek out your faith community, it really does help. And when I talked to Voldemort about what the Bible says about marriage, how we always said this was not ever something that we would consider, all these promises we made to each other, you know what this guy said? He had the audacity to say, well, I meant it at the time. 
So, my third point is choose someone who keeps their promises. It's so basic, right? Promises are made to be kept. We learn that even when we're little kids, like making pinky promises. But the one person who promised to never hurt me hurt me worse than anyone else ever had. The person who promised to never abandon me did. But God didn't. And in fact, the only way I got through this whole thing was with God. He was there with me just like he's been with me every other time in my life, and he never goes back on his word. Psalm 145, 13 says, the Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. God makes over 8,000 promises in the Bible, and he keeps every single one of them. When he told Abraham that he would make his descendants great, when he told the Israelites that he would get them out of, G out of Egypt, he didn't one day just be like, eh, I meant it at the time. He follows through on things that he says because he is good and he is faithful. And I'll never forget when all of this was happening to me, my best friend told me, I hope this doesn't mess up your faith. And I was able to so confidently tell her that it didn't. And actually, my faith is the only reason that this whole thing didn't break me. One of those promises that the Bible gives us is in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God promises to give us a peace that makes no sense. And this was a situation where I really should have felt anything but peace. And even though the whole situation didn't end up the way I wanted it to at the time, my prayers were still answered. Because I ran to God instead of away from him, because I relied on him and relied on my faith, he gave me peace and a strength that makes no sense. Of course I was upset, but I knew that he had a plan for all of it, and because of that and because of him, that's the only way I was able to make it through. The only reason I can stand here today and talk about this and be okay and healed and better and honestly even grateful that it happened is because of God. And at the time, I didn't even know what God's plan was. I just knew he had one. And little did I know that he had something a million times better waiting for me on the other side. Fast forward a bit, and I made the biggest upgrade of all time. Can we get that picture up there? Marcus. <laughs> I went from being with someone who tolerated me, who treated me like trash, to someone who really is my best friend, to someone who treats me like a queen, to someone who helps me grow in my relationship with God every single day, and to someone who makes me feel every day like I'm living in that fairy tale that I now know does exist. And it's all because of God. And if we could get that next picture. A few of you were there. So this church family has really seen me at my lowest and my highest points. And it is so clear that this could only happen from God. All of the little pieces of our lives that had to come together in the right place at the right time had a face before it, including pain in both of our lives, all of that, to come together the way it did when we were both ready for each other that could have only happened from God. And it might sound crazy, but I would go through all of that pain before a million times over if it means getting to where I am now. I never in a million years thought the divorce would be part of my story. But God knew. God knew that before I was even born. And he had a plan for me, and he knew I would get through it. And even though I was ghosted in my relationship, I was never ghosted by God. And through this whole thing, God fulfilled another promise that was made in Deuteronomy 31.6. 
Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified or afraid because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's one of the most beautiful promises there is. God never left my side through this whole mess, and he is not gonna leave yours. Whatever you go through in life, pain, disappointment, heartbreak, any of that, he's gonna be right there with you through it, and you are never alone. And unlike people, there is nothing you could ever do that's gonna make him stop loving you. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Like I said, God is love. God never gives up, never loses faith. God is hopeful. God endures in every single circumstance. And once you've accepted Christ, there is nothing that can separate you from him. He's not gonna one day just be like, I don't love you anymore. He's not gonna one day just up and leave. He promises to be with us, and not just in this life, but he promises to be with us forever. By God sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for us, he paved the way for us to spend forever with him in heaven by paying for every single sin any of us would ever commit, including the people who ghost us. But he doesn't force that on us. He gives us an opportunity to choose it. And if you want to make that choice, if you want God to be with you forever as the Lord of your life, I wanna lead you in a prayer. So with your eyes closed, just say, God, I thank you for creating me, for bringing me into your family. Lord, I know that I have messed up parts of my life. I have gone away from what you've called for me, but I know that that has all been forgiven by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And God, I just thank you for that sacrifice. Thank you for your love. And God, just come into my heart and I want you to be my Lord and Savior. And I love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer, that is the greatest decision. I know we say this all the time, but it really is the greatest decision you could ever make. And please, please tell someone, tell a leader here, tell someone so that we can help you on your next steps so we can be praying for you and walk through this with you. You guys are young, so most likely you've never been divorced, but maybe your parents have, or maybe you've seen your friend's parents get divorced, or maybe you've just been through a really bad breakup. Or maybe you have just been let down by the last person that you ever thought would hurt you. Maybe my story is one you can personally relate to or maybe it's one that you can just learn from so you can avoid making the same mistakes I made. But that's why I feel like it's so important to share our stories even though it's uncomfortable. Because in reality, this isn't my story to keep to myself. It's God's. And it's a testimony to his faithfulness and his power. And it's not even a sad story. It's a story of peace and restoration and faith. And God taking something bad and making it to something so much better than I could have ever imagined. And no matter what, I pray that when you guys are at the lowest points of your life, that you'll stay close to God as he promises to stay close to you. And even when it feels impossible, even if it feels like it makes no sense, trust that he has a plan for you. Let's pray. God, I thank you for our stories, our lives, our experiences, and I thank you for the hope that you give us and the plan that you have for us, God. I thank you that no matter what happens, we have you to lean on. I thank you that you have promised to never leave us. And God, I just pray that whatever we go through in our lives, that we'll always remember that. That we'll remember all those promises that you made and how you are faithful on those. And I pray that that brings us peace. 
Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name.